And so today, April 13th, 2017, was the day that America woke up to the sudden knowledge that bombs have mothers, that all of the conventional non-nuclear bombs in the American military arsenal have one big, beautiful mother. And there she is. The bomb's official name for bookkeeping purposes in the military is the GBU-43. The letters on the side of the bomb describe its function, what you can expect from it, massive ordnance air blast. But the military doesn't want us to call it the GBU-43 or the MOAB. Names are important to the military. They name their bases after war heroes, after generals, including generals who've committed treason by fighting in the Confederate Army against the United States of America. The biggest U.S. military base in the world, the one with the biggest military population, is in Fort Hood in Texas, named after treasonous Confederate General John Bell Hood. But the military's most important names, the names that are designed to deliver a message, sometimes subliminal, sometimes very direct, are the names of weapons. The military's best names for weapons humanize the weapons. That is what they are intended to do. The GBU-43, the biggest non-nuclear bomb the United States has never, ever used until today. April 13th, 2017, the GBU-43 had to wait years for its first use. During the Bush administration, it replaced the BLU-82, which until then was our biggest bomb. The BLU-82 was used frequently in Vietnam. The military's name for it was the Daisy Cutter, not the baby killer, not the family killer, not the village killer, the Daisy Cutter. The military's nicknames for bombs are designed to do two things, impress you with something about the bomb, its precision, its power, its enormity. But the best military names for weapons and bombs are designed to inspire awe and affection. And so the bomb that the Bush and Obama administration refused to use has not, and has now been used by the Trump administration is called the mother of all bombs. When the president was asked today about using that bomb for the first time in history, it sounded like he did not personally authorize the use of the bomb in that instance. It sounded like he had perhaps given a general authorization to the Defense Secretary Mattis to use whatever weapon he decided was right for the mission. Did you authorize it, sir? Uh, everybody knows exactly what happened, so, and what I do is I authorize my military. We have the greatest military in the world, and they've done a job as usual, so we have given them total authorization, and that's what they're doing. And, frankly, that's why they've been so successful lately. The president got glowing reviews last week from most of the media in his first use of Tomahawk missiles. The reviews on his use of the military's most destructive non-nuclear bomb will have to wait until there are at least initial reports on the number of civilian casualties, if any, and what tactical gain was achieved by the GBU-43. Now to the news that Donald Trump cannot bomb away. The Guardian is reporting that British intelligence first became aware in late to, uh, 2015 of suspicious interactions between figures connected to Trump and known or suspect, suspected Russian agents. This intelligence was passed to the U.S. as part of a routine exchange of information. Sources also told the paper that over the next six months, until summer 2016, a number of Western agencies shared further information on contacts between Trump's inner circle and Russians. The European countries that passed on electronic intelligence included Germany, Estonia, and Poland. According to The Guardian, the alleged conversations were picked up by chance as part of routine surveillance of Russian intelligence assets. At no point was British intelligence carrying out an operation against Donald Trump or his campaign. Former Trump campaign advisor Carter Page, who was the subject of a foreign intelligence surveillance court warrant last summer, said this morning that he may have discussed lifting U.S. sanctions on Russia during a trip to Moscow last year.
It sounds like, process. from what you're saying, it's possible that you may have discussed the easing of sanctions. Something may have come up in a conversation. I have no recollection, and there is nothing specifically that I would have done that would have given people that impression, George. But you can't say without uh, without equivocation that you didn't discuss the easing of sanctions. Someone may have brought it up. I have no recollection, and if it d was, it was not something I was offering or someone was that someone was asking for. President Trump's CIA director, Mike Pompeo, said this today about WikiLeaks. As long as they make a splash, they care nothing about the lives they put at risk or the damage they cause to national security. WikiLeaks walks like a hostile intelligence service and talks like a hostile intelligence service. It's time to call out WikiLeaks for what it really is, a non-state hostile intelligence service often abetted by state actors like Russia. And here is what his boss, the President of the United States, has had to say about WikiLeaks. Now, this just came out. This just came out. WikiLeaks, I love WikiLeaks. Boy, that WikiLeaks has done a job on her, hasn't it? This WikiLeaks is like a treasure trove. Joining us now. Malcolm Nance, MSNBC counterterrorism and intelligence analyst, David Korn, Washington bureau chief for Mother Jones and an MSNBC political analyst, and David Frum, senior editor for The Atlantic. Uh, Malcolm, uh, quickly, I just wanted to talk about the, the massive bomb that was dropped today and, and your interpretation of its use and what you think it might have been able to achieve in that usage. Well, the GBU-43 is, is really just an area uh, destruction device. It's designed to make a big blast over pressure, a lot of earthquaking, knock down tunnels, destroy people and uh, materials that are out in the field. It's just another bomb. And I think people are sort of looking over the fact that it was dropped in a combat zone. A B-52 carrying, you know, 32 uh, JDAM bombs could have ca caused much more devastation with much more precision. The Air Force wanted to use this device, and they did. Uh, David, from the reports today that it, it wasn't just the British uh, who were picking up something involving uh, Trump world uh, and the Russians, Estonia, Poland, uh, it, it, it sounds like there was a lot to pick up. And the Poles have a particularly sophisticated intelligence service um, and have been uh, very, they've been very interested above all in the Ukraine case. Poland and Ukraine are neighbors with deep historical relationships. Poland maintains many more consulates in Ukraine than the United States does. And it knows a lot about the career of Paul Manafort. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, that name would ring some very s noisy alarm bells in Warsaw. Uh, David Korn, the, the, the way the, uh, we just heard the CIA director talk about WikiLeaks uh, compared to the way the president has talked about WikiLeaks. It's another one of those moments where you see that, at least in the instance of his choice for CIA director, uh, there's no inhibition about saying things today. I mean, he, you had to know if you were the CIA director mm -hmm. and you anticipate other human beings' reactions to things, <laughs> you had to know. But I and others, we're going to put those two hunks of video together tonight, that what he had to say today about WikiLeaks and what Donald Trump said about WikiLeaks during the campaign. Well, it's all very head spinning because during the campaign, Pompeo himself was re was putting forward on his Twitter feed and his and his campaign account information coming from WikiLeaks. So by his own definition, he and the guy he works for, who happens to be the president of the United States, were in league with the WikiLeaks operation, which, was, of course, his own predecessor says, was part of a Russian clandestine operation to subvert the American election. So if you really start thinking about what he says, it is mind-blowing. And you know what? Maybe we should have a congressional investigation. <laughs> Maybe I don't know. That, that's crazy talk. But nevertheless, it is so absurd that you know. Because at the same time, Donald Trump still says this is all a hoax. Uh, Malcolm Nance, you've literally written, literally written the book about this, about the, the Russian influence in this election and what they were up to. Uh, just give us your assessment about the last 24 hours of new information. Well, I'm, I'm afraid to say this is what separates intelligence <laughs> officers from journalists. I, you know, I wrote this seven, almost seven months ago now, that uh, if you were ever going to get a scoop 
uh, with relation to uh, information coming out about the Trump administration's activities related to foreign intelligence. It was going to come from a foreign intelligence agency. Pretty sure that I said Estonia would be the first one because, as we learned, they have very close ties. Uh, with the United States and other allied nations, and they're very, very good at certain types of special intelligence. That's what we call signals intelligence. And our sister agency, GCHQ and DGSE in France, they have a vested interest in knowing what's going on there. On the other hand, it was very surprising to finally hear Mike Pompeo uh, come out and, and declare WikiLeaks a non-state hostile intelligence agency. I wrote a whole chapter in my book about how WikiLeaks was a non-state intelligence agency and a wholly owned subsidiary of Russian intelligence, the FSB. Uh, that being said, it's going to be fascinating for anyone who now has been found to cooperate with WikiLeaks, because this is essentially uh, him verbalizing in an unclassified setting an intelligence finding that they were in league not only with Russian intelligence, perhaps by extension, but now a designated <laughs> non state hostile intelligence agency. It's going to make for some very, very interesting congressional investigations and trials. There are people in the Trump administration. Pompeo and Tillerson, who are trying to go legit, as you used to say about actors who move from one kind of work <laughs> to another kind of work. Mm. Um, and, and, uh, and they are trying to hem the president in. And one of the interesting questions, and we'll, we'll be studying this in political science for a long time, is can you hem in the president? Can you remove the president's authority and agency? Because there is this group of now Pompeo, now Tillerson, before that Mattis, before that McMaster, who want to encourage the president to golf more and watch more television and let them run the government. Mm -hmm. uh, in other circumstances, that would look like a rather sinister thing. Mm -hmm. um, in this circumstance, it may look like the second best option. Uh, and David, uh, David, Cor go ahead, David. I was just going to say, the question is, can they really wipe off the stench of Donald Trump's campaign and, if not the collusion, encouraging this um, Putin operation to subvert American democracy. I mean, they all admit that it happened. Tillerson's admitted it. Nikki Haley's admitted it. Mike Pompeo said it today. While the president keeps denying that anything of the sort happened, and Roger Stone's out there pushing conspiracy theories on, on, on this network and others. And so can they kind of act as if they're legitimate? even when they're working for a fellow who denies the original sin of this administration and who still continues to say things that make no sense. I, I think the answer to that, David, would be um, from a moral point of view, maybe not. From a practical point of view, everybody has to be less fussy. Malcolm Nance, isn't it a, a, a question of what, what are they saying from this point forward? I mean, when you, when you look at what Tillerson was saying the week before the chemical attack in Syria, uh, he seemed like he hadn't even found his way around the office yet and what, didn't have the vaguest idea what a reasonable talking point sounded like on Syria, saying he was going to leave it to, what, the democratic expression of the Syrian people, what would happen to Assad. Everything he has said since the uh, chemical attack has been a, a strong statement about uh, both Syria and the Russian involvement in that, uh, including him speculating that Russia could possibly have known about it before the fact. Uh, and, and so so is, is it one of those things where, like with Pompeo today, you, you, you pick a spot and you say, we're going to start watching him from here forward and see what he does? Well, y yes, because prior to last week, things were pretty rudderless in mm -hmm. the White House. And that, that rudderlessness came from the, you know, the palace intrigue that was going on between Jared Kushner, Steve Bannon, uh, Donald Trump jumping in both feet uh, in, in, in certain things. But now you have General uh, McMaster and you have uh, the Secretary of Defense, Mattis, giving strong indications that there has to be a certain way. Most interestingly is Nikki Haley, as U.N. ambassador, has been far ahead of uh, even McMaster and Mattis and in the strength of her statements about Russia and Syria. And so now it, it appears that it's coming together, at least on these two points, even though, uh, as I contend, the attack on Syria was a complete wash. I mean, we didn't destroy anything. We didn't destroy chemical weapons. We just showed that we know how to turn the key and launch cruise missiles. So I think that the, the White House, in some respects, is, is, is coming together. And if these threats and, and, and statements about North Korea or any uh, are, are true, as we're going to talk about a little later, 
they had better get their acts together because this is the sort of talk that will bring this nation into war or to a crisis that will, you know, resemble uh, the paces to war. Uh, David, when you talk about hemming in a president, that has been done in the past. In a, in a more subtle way. It just the advisors would basically, the, the experts in the area, defense, whatever it was, would present a, a set of, of possibilities, only one of which looked possible and the others just weren't. And so though that was always the traditional way if the advisors were trying to hem in the president. Well, there's a more extreme way, which um, uh, you'll, you'll remember from the history. James Schlesinger uh, in the last days of Watergate uh, telling the nuclear command, by yeah. the way, yeah. uh, I'm putting myself as Secretary of Defense into the nuclear command. If you get any funny orders from the president, just run this them is past when, me. This is when President Nixon was up late at night in the White House drunk and approaching, the, pills, yeah. approaching the point of being forced to resign. Sec his Secretary of Defense said, don't take any nuclear orders from him in the middle of the night. Right. And to, unless you've cleared them. Yeah. Um, so presidents can be hemmed in. The, the question is that how many weeks did that take? Did that occur over the yes, less very intervention? relatively short period of time? Uh, can you do it over four years? <laughs> Probably not. In the end, the president fires all of these people. Um, and mm. uh, one of the things that, that Donald Trump has displayed is and, and he's done it now to his White House staff, Steve Bannon and others. He doesn't like it when anyone near him gets too big. And right now, Mattis is very big, mm -hmm. and Tillerson is getting bigger, and Nikki Haley in particular is getting very big. How will the president feel about that tomorrow, next week, the week after that? Uh, David Korn, isn't that a matter of uh, how Saturday Night Live treats it? If Saturday Night Live says <laughs> Nikki <laughs> yes. Haley is the brains of yeah. the Trump White House, and then that's when the clock starts ticking? Yeah, so I would amend David's astute observation. It's not how people, if uh, people around Donald Trump getting big, it's how it's portrayed and perceived. And because that's really how he views the world. He views the world and how the world is viewing him. The reality doesn't matter as much. And if we talk about hemming in and McMaster's getting his hands around the National Security Council and Mattis being adult, we see, Malcolm alluded to this too, that it only takes Trump seven seconds of to say something or even less seconds to tweet something about North Korea or something else that can be incredibly destabilizing. So you can hem in a guy to a certain degree, but when he's up at six in the morning, I don't think Mattis or McMasters or even his wife are so, looking over his shoulders. So, so there still is a lot of instability there. Should NBC have like some kind of corporate ethics officer in the Saturday Night Live writing's room saying, yeah, please don't say anything no, about Nikki no, Haley no, that over no, magnifies no, her role? No corporate <laughs> interference there. But maybe, maybe like for the sake of the country, they should. Like, we don't want those jokes. We're going we're gonna to have to They're leave all it. patriots at SNL. They're all patriots. That's correct. They're right upstairs. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos. Videos.